How's it going boys? Razine here for Astrophotography and welcome to the Night Sky series. What is the Night Sky? It's my created list of deep sky objects, nebulae, galaxies, meteor showers, anything that I think is interesting to image or look at throughout the night skies in January. So how this is going to work is I'm going to have a breakdown of focal lengths. Today, this month is from 100 millimeters all the way up to 2000 millimeters from a full frame DSLR camera, the Canon 5D Mark III. However, I'll have a equivalent sensor size breakdown on the side. So no matter what sensor you have in your camera, you're gonna find out the focal length you need for that particular target. Right, with all that said, if this is interesting to you and you find it useful, let me know in the comments down below. It really helps let me know that you want me to carry on making this kind of content. And let's begin. So before we get into the deep sky objects, I'm going to give constellation of the month to constellation Auriga, one of my favorite constellations out there. Auriga, the charioteer, very good window of opportunity at this time of the month to take photos of it. Still from this month into next, still plenty on it. I'm gonna have a video come out in the next few days maybe, or a couple of weeks about the information about Auriga. So we're gonna go into detail about Auriga, but rest assured, I'm giving it the constellation of the month for January, and now on to deep sky objects. 100 to 200 millimeters on that full frame camera, I'm gonna be recommending you go over to the constellation of Orion. Now within Orion, at those focal lengths, you're going to be able to capture basically the entire complex, all the main juicy goodness of nebulosity within that constellation. So at those focal lengths, you're talking about the Orion Nebula, you're talking about the Horsehead Nebula, the Witchhead Nebula, Casper the Friendly Ghost Nebula, Bernard's loop, that's at 100. If you go into 200 millimeters, you're punching down a bit more. You don't have that as much negative space. Have to work on the framing a bit more, but you can still get loads of targets. And I love multi-target wide field imagery. So next at 200 to 400 millimeters of focal length, we're gonna swing all the way around to the constellation of the month, Auriga. And one of my personal favorites, IC405, which is the Flaming Star Nebula. This is one of the first nebulas I captured on this channel. It holds a special place in my heart. I love the look of it. I love the size, the intricacy of this nebula. It's a reflective emission nebula. So AE Auriga, the star in the middle of the flaming star is illuminating the entire nebula, giving it a bit of reflective element in the middle and then emission from the sides. So it would definitely at least benefit from some RGB imagery. So color imaging, whether that's LRGB filters or whatever, one shot color, it would definitely benefit from some of that because of the reflective element. But for the emission side, you're really gonna want to use hydrogen alpha at least, maybe a HA RGB image, Mwah, would look beautiful. So that is my recommendation for 200 to 400 millimeters. Slightly wider field, more targets again, but very interesting picture. Another one for 400 millimeters now because it's a bit of a sweet spot for the imaging, nice long, wide focal length, very forgiving, especially if you're a beginner, is gonna be NGC 1499. This is the California Nebula up in the constellation of Perseus. Again, one of my favorites as well. The first one I did a long HARGB project on. Absolutely love this Nebula. Looks amazing if you put it into the Hubble palette because you have all the color tones from gold to blue and it's absolutely phenomenal. So my recommendation for 400 millimeters is going to be the California Nebula. At 500, 600 millimeters, I'm gonna recommend we swing over to the bull itself, constellation of Taurus. And within Taurus, we're gonna be looking at the ever popular, yet strangely challenging M45 Pleiades. This very famous cluster full of blue reflective gases in a distinct shape, looks almost like a bouquet of flowers. Now it is completely reflective, this nebula. So keep those narrowband filters aside. They will not do you any good for this target, keep them in. We need full spectrum. We need one shot colors with light pollution filters or no filters or your LRGB, okay? So keep the narrowband away. What makes this one very challenging though is drawing that blue reflection out from the stars but keeping the stars under control. It's very challenging at first. It gets you thinking about the way you play with your curves in your imaging editing program but it's very rewarding. And then the, if you go wider in your focal length as well, there's loads of dust around this, this um, cluster, but you're gonna need dark skies. Okay, so the Pleiades is good for almost any light pollution level. 
but the less light pollution you have, the more background dust you're gonna pull out. It is a wonderful region of sky. Give it a look. Right, to 700 to 800 millimeters of focal length, we're gonna be swinging over to my zodiacal constellation, Gemini. And within Gemini, we're looking at IC443, the Jellyfish Nebula. So the Jellyfish Nebula gets its name because this is one of those that really is obvious that it looks like a jellyfish. It's kind of curling up with the tendrils coming down off the bottom of it. Kind of reminds me of Brethren Moon from Dead Space. I try not to think about that too much, but we have this wonderful emission nebula. So again, LRGB will help, but really narrowband is gonna be your best friend here, especially hydrogen alpha. So maybe a HARGB composite. The nice thing about this constellation, you can frame it in many ways. You can obviously frame it just landscape like we do most of our pictures, but if we put it portrait, print it off portrait, with a bit of negative space on top of it, it will look like it's coming out of the bottom of the frame, floating to the top, and I think that might be a very interesting way to present this nebula. So at those focal lengths, my recommendation would be the Jellyfish Nebula. So now at 1,000 millimeters, I'm gonna recommend we swing back over to the constellation of Orion, and within Orion, we have the awfully distinct and very famous Horsehead and Flame Nebula, IC434 and NGC2024 respectively. These will respond really well to HARGB imaging. The nice thing about this is at 1000 millimeters, we're not giving too much to Horsehead, we're not giving too much to the Flame, it's nicely balanced. And in my opinion, behind the Horsehead Dark Nebula itself, there's almost, that looks like a wall of flame coming up behind it. And I think it looks amazing when you throw a bit of HA in there. So my recommendation at 1000 millimeters would be the Horsehead Nebula. Just got a control island attack, but I'm sure you can do it. I'd love to see your images. 1500 millimeters, we're staying in Orion, but just on the cusp of it, we're gonna be looking at the Monkey Head Nebula, which is NGC 2174. Monkey Head Nebula, again, a mission type nebula, but will very much benefit from your full narrowband treatment. So a Hubble palette, you normally see this presented in a Hubble palette, very nice mixture of all the colors in there. And I've not really had much just chance to image it myself because of where Orion is in my particular skies. But I do love looking at this and all the different ways you can present it. It's a nice compact nebula at this field of view. And you can just shoot it with your three channels. If you really want to do O3, S2 and HA, great. Bit of HARRGB or HARGB as well would be beneficial, but it's right there. It's a nice ball of emission nebulosity waiting for you to photograph. So at one and a half thousand millimeters, my recommendation would be the monkey head nebula. And then for 2000 millimeters, yeah, it's another slightly compact nebula up in the constellation of Cassiopeia. We have NGC 281, the Pac-Man nebula. Again, this might be looking like it's good for HRGB, but it's another compact ball of emission goodness. It would really respond well to your narrowband filters. Not to say you can't do RGB imaging on it, but most of these emission nebulas will benefit if you give it even just a sprinkling, a bit of salt bay of HA on it. it. Really brings the image to life, adds a whole nother layer of vibrance and detail to these protos, and a whole nother layer of details just come out because of the hydrogen alpha data. Okay, on to planets for you planet hunters now. There's two in our night sky for January, two prominent ones. The first one being Jupiter. I mean, first one from distances. We're talking about Jupiter, the king of planets itself, will be in good position to photograph throughout this month. Of course, you're gonna need either long optics, barlow lenses, small sensors, or a combination of all three to really punch your way in to get those good details of Jupiter. If you wanna break into planetary imaging and you're not too sure about it, I have a great talk from one of the kings of planetary imaging himself, Damien Peach. I'll have that linked in the corner and in the video description as well. If you want something a bit more challenging and you really have a long telescope to use, Uranus is also up in the night sky. The turquoise planet itself is available to image, but it is very small because it's a planet, it's tiny, it's very far away from us. It's gonna take really long optics, good Barlow lenses, good seeing conditions. It's a challenge, but I'm sure you're up to it. I'd love to see your pictures of the planet Uranus. I really had to put the planet preface in there, didn't I? We're all kids. Grow up. 
Okay, moon phases. If you're a moon hunter, you like imaging our moon, want to really punch in those fine details of the lunar surface, want to know when to get the hydrogen alpha filters out, or when just to have a nice early night because of the full moon, here's the phases for you. The last quarter moon is going to fall on the 4th of January, with the new moon appearing on the 11th of January. The first quarter is on the 18th of January, with the full moon finally falling on the 25th of January, that full moon being the wolf moon. The nomenclature behind January's wolf moon is that the Native Americans and medieval Europeans used to call it the wolf moon because of the howling of wolves during this time of the year. It is thought that wolves would howl so much in the midwinter months because of the lack of food, the lack of resources available, they would howl in hunger and howl in distress or hunting packs. So it was known as the wolf moon. Other names for this as well could be the old moon as well as the ice moon. And the University of London's Almanac, rather lazily, called this moon the uh, moon after Yule. I've, I'd much rather the description of wolf moon. Thanks, London. That's a bit more imaginative. So a few events that's going to be happening throughout January that might be of interest to you. First of all, on the 3rd of January, Earth is going to reach its perihelion. So that is the distance furthest away from the sun on the heliocentric model, of course, which is what we use. Earth is at its furthest distance away from the sun. Now on the 14th of January, we have Saturn very close to the moon, about 2.1 degrees of arc. So that's quite close. You can get these both in about a 300 millimeter lens. Now the earlier is better with this because they do very slowly drift apart from each other. So we're looking around 5 to 6 p.m. in the Northern Hemisphere in the United Kingdom where I am. Of course, your times may vary. You're gonna have to just double check it, but they do start close together. That's where you can get 300 millimeter lens and they do drift apart. So getting in there at a good time in the early afternoon or the late evening, early evening is gonna be very good. Four days later on the 18th of January, we have Jupiter doing the same kind of thing, wants to get in on the same action. Jupiter, quite close to the moon as well. You can get it about a 600 millimeter lens. So very long actually, it's very close. Now it'll be there for about five hours between five and 10 p.m. In again, in the United Kingdom, the thing is they will also slowly drift apart. If you get there later and later to the game, you're gonna to have to use a wider and wider lens, but it could be an interesting photo opportunity, especially at those lengths. There's no occlusion, it's just very close, but there'll be an occlusion later in the year, I'm sure of it. Then finally for events on the 20th of January, we have the moon so very close to the Pleiades. It's had enough of planets. It's gone to reflection nebula now. It is so very close especially between 5 and 6 p.m. Again, this is one of those that you get there earlier, the better. Now, it could be worth positioning your telescope in a custom, uh, custom coordinate so you can get both in the frame, get a few initial shots with the moon in it, and then take your stacked images of the Pleiades so you get all the dust and all the reflection. You can, image, you can edit the image of Pleiades as you need to and then composite your image of the moon over it. That'd be my recommendation. If you start trying to expose for the Pleiades, you're gonna blow the moon out. And if you're gonna expose for the moon, you're not gonna get any of that dust. So if you really want an image of both of these together, it's gonna to be a composite. And that is gonna be my recommendation for that. I'd love to see it. If you can capture this and get all the velocity out and compose the moon over it, I think it's gonna be a wonderful photo and I'd love to see it. Wrapping up for this month, we have a meteor shower, the Quadranids up around the north to northeast of the night sky throughout the night. And well, it runs from the 26th of December through to the 13th of January, with the peak being around the 3rd to 4th of January, where we could see and expect meteors from up to about 140 meteors an hour, depending on your local conditions, depending on your local light pollution and things like that. Now the moon is in its last quarter, so it really shouldn't interfere with this. It's gonna be very dim. It's probably already set at this point or it's just rising, it shouldn't really interfere. So get those wide angle lenses out, get those interferometers out, point it at that region of the sky, do your time lapses, whatever, catch yourself a meteor shower. And that is it, that's the night sky in January all wrapped up. Now, if you had anything that you want to add to the conversation, if I've missed anything, drop a comment down below. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you disliked it, go ahead and hit that thumbs down button, won't take it personally. And if you are interested in this kind of information and these kind of videos, give me a subscribe. I've got lots more planned for the rest of the year. In the meantime, all that's left for me to say thank you very much for watching. Hope you have clear skies. Keep looking up, keep them cameras clicking. I'll see you later.